Hello, everyone. This is Mike Anderson, and welcome to my podcast about contemporary American politics. I write about politics and the factors that influence our political views, including genetics, culture, and the passage of time. We label these views our political morality because they are based on elements of our personality and experience applied to our view of government. Human morality is always changing because of changes in human society. The speed of that change is based on a tug of war between the idea, ideas of change agents and those who prefer the status quo. One of those ideas which emerged in the 1960s is postmodernism. Today, I will be discussing postmodernism with Stephen Hicks, professor of philosophy at Rockford University in Rockford, Illinois. Stephen is well known for his book, Exploiting Postmodernism, published in 2004. I highly recommend this book for anyone who is interested in learning more about postmodernism and its influence on American society. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me on. When I look at your website and see all the topics you write about, the word polymath comes to mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Philosophy is obviously a prominent theme, but you write about the arts, humor, and business ethics also. How do you keep up with all this? Well, I think one of the things that attracted me to philosophy is its uh, foundational status, but it has its uh, finger in many pies, so to speak. There's always a philosophy of every of anything. Uh, so I think intellectually, I, I like the idea of, a, of of being a Renaissance man. The whole world is interesting. Uh, but then your question is more specifically about time management. I, the, the answer is I don't keep up on everything. I, uh, I follow my nose. I have some strategic things that I make a point of keeping up on, but uh, I like what I do. I read a lot. So uh, I guess over time, it adds up to a significant amount of stuff. Um, before we start talking about postmodernism specifically, I want to take a moment and explain how we first got together. Uh, for the benefit of the audience. Um, <clears throat> I wrote my first book in 2017, which was called The Progressive Gene. And I took off on ideas of Jonathan Haidt and began to discuss uh, political philosophy in relation to genetic influences and the like. Um, the plan for my second book was to write about the conservatives. So I would cover the left and the right but I got sidetracked when I got exposure to Jordan Peterson. So I started listening to him in the beginning of 2018 and I was attracted to his ideas. I think he's brilliant and uh, has a lot to contribute to the intellectual space. Uh, and I saw him interview you. So that's how I got uh, introduced to you. Um, and I started thinking about tribalism because uh, Peterson talks a lot about uh, neo-Marxism and postmodernism influence on today's society. I bought your book, I read your book, and I thought it was great. Um, it made it easy for me to understand. Made it easy for me to understand the history, and I think there's a lot more to your book than just the philosophy part of it. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, yeah, one of the, my big themes of my whole career has been that philosophy uh, really is life and death, that we do uh, have all kinds of abstract, what seem like distant from real life, head in the clouds types of questions that philosophers engage with, but how you answer those questions when you take them seriously and start to live them, make huge differences in your personal life, obviously in your immediate society, but then also uh, politics is downstream from, from those abstract philosophical commitments that we make. Yep. Yes, I agree. So uh, I reached out to you. Uh, you were going to be at a Young Americans for Liberty conference in Cleveland. You were going to be a speaker there. So we met there and had lunch. And that was our first meeting together. Uh, but that helped yeah. me move forward with my second book, which was uh, the title of the book is Tribalism. Uh, the Curse of 21st Century America, which basically describes, with your help, 
uh, the development of tribalism in the United States, which you know probably dates to the mid '90s and and beyond. Uh, but it's it's a, you know to me the most significant social problem in the United States today, because the tribes are not communicating, and each have their own point of view, do not accept the truth of the other group, and so it makes it very difficult for our society to move forward. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, all of that's true. I think your timeline is about right. Tribalism upticked, I think, as a, as a demographic problem by the turn of the millennium. Um, and it, I think it's a, it's a reversion to a more ancient kind of mode of human, human living back when we were less knowledgeable, less conceptual, less logical, less able to think and, and, uh, and survive as self-responsible individuals. Um, yeah, yeah, tribalism is a social problem, but I think more importantly, tribalism is an individual problem. Uh, if you don't mature uh, when you're a young person to be able to think for yourself, uh, to uh, trust your own judgment, to have the emotional resources and the emotional resilience to deal with life's problems, uh, then what you are naturally going to do is feel bewildered, threatened by, unable to take on life's challenges. And I think that's uh, uh, something that leads people to seek some sort of security. And one form of uh, easy security seeking is to just merge yourself in some group. If, uh, you know, if, if, if you can't, for example, <laughs> I don't want to go with these animal metaphors too far, but if you are, you're, you're like a sheep and uh, you know that the world is big, bad and scary and you don't feel able to, to, to take it on, to go off and have your own adventures, you feel like a sheep, well, then you're going to want to stick to the herd and you'll just graft onto the, the, uh, the, the, the closest herd that seems like it's going to provide you with some sort of support network and some sort of lifestyle. And I think that's exactly what tribalism is. It's individuals who are not yet developed as individuals seeking to fill that void by means of group affiliations. Yep. And it's safe. And you don't have to think because you joined the tribe. And if That's you've right. accepted the thought process, then, you know, you're good. Uh, it's interesting to observe right. the, in, in some of these uh, protests, you know, uh, reporters or interested parties will interview the people protesting and ask them why they, you know, what their understanding of the, of the issue is. And often they don't, they don't have any answer. You know, they've never thought through sure. why they're protesting. They're just following the group, as you said. Sure. That's right. Yeah. And so we're, you, you see it coming out in political forms. Absolutely. So po people get fired up uh, about whatever the political issue is. They might not have a deep understanding of the issue, but they, as human beings, understand it's an important issue and they want to feel that there's some meaning and significance in their life. And so politics is one vehicle through which people can, uh, can, can seek that. But if you are not committed to actually doing the hard work of thinking and looking at the arguments on all sides and trying to sort through the complexities if you want a shortcut then some sort of tribal political identification is the is the is the easy way to go and so i think the political tribalism that we are seeing now is just a resurgence of the kinds of uh, you know, family tribalisms and old-fashioned religious tribalisms that really have dominated human social life for for millennia right I agree. All right. Well, let's uh, talk more about postmodernism because that's the reason for the podcast. Um, I sent you some mm. notes and I'm going to refer to those notes and yeah, moving for forward. Um, the first question is, uh, I'm interested in your view on the state of postmodernism today. Uh, as you're, I mentioned in your book, you really talk about a evolution of postmodernism uh, it was new and exciting in academia, and then it became well-established, and then it became dogma, which I think mm. it is today. Mm. But it was dogma mm. by, if I'm correct, the 90s, 
so how has it changed if it has in the past 20 years? Yeah. Well, I don't think it has changed intellectually in the last 20 years. Uh, you know, postmodernism is a deeply skeptical, cynical uh, uh, understanding of knowledge and human relationships. And you know, once you go down the skeptical road uh, pretty far uh, and the cynical road pretty far, there's uh, kind of a nihilistic end state. And if you're a smart person and you follow the, the logic of your position, you reach that end state pretty quickly. So I think that was reached by, uh, I think the 1990s is, uh, is, is fine. So there's no more road to travel there. And I can remember smart people back in the 1990s saying, okay, this is already starting to seem kind of tired and we're just seeing the same arguments cycled and recycled. And a lot of smart people just moved off in other directions uh, as they just kind of left it. So what I think happened, and uh, this, is, this is blunt honesty, I think the people who stayed with postmodernism were uh, kind of the second raiders and the third raiders. They were the kinds of intellectuals who did not really have high intellectual ambitions to figure out what the truth was. They didn't do a lot of work. They, uh, they wanted to be part of a sexy movement, whatever that seemed to be. They liked having their tenured positions. The academic lifestyles can be very, very comfortable. And so the people who stayed with postmodernism tended to be the second raiders. And they were just keeping the torch alive and reheating the arguments and repackaging the arguments and so on. But I think uh, uh, what has more seriously happened than with, uh, with postmodernism is once you reach the position of saying, look, uh, truth doesn't matter, or there is no truth, nobody really knows anything, Everybody is just a part of these social groups that make who they are. And we just have to make a commitment to whatever our tribe or our social group is. Uh, once you reach that position intellectually, you stop being into an intellectual and you start saying the important thing is activism. And so what you found in the, uh, find rather in the academic world in the 90s and the 2000s is a large number of professors who stop being liberal educators in that sense of educating people and they started to see themselves explicitly as trainers of activists right that my job is not to educate liberally young people but rather i have my agenda and i want to use my position to more or less indoctrinate the next generation so that they will go out and become activists so i think uh, uh, that has then set things up for the students who were going through in the 90s and in the early 2000s were largely uh, trained to be activists, not deep thinkers, not truth seekers. And then uh, by the time they got their degrees, got some prominence in whatever career they went off and do by 2010 or so, then the 20 teens is when we started to see uh, uh, kind of, uh, in lots of other cultural spheres, these ideas spilling out so we saw it more in journalism, politics was affected, uh, and, and so forth. So yeah, yeah. what the state of just postmodernism gonna... is today is that it's not an intellectual movement, but rather it's an activist right. movement. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not at all uh, interested, really, even in understanding its own forefathers. So I think most of the people who are activist postmodern types they've not even necessarily read Rousseau or Foucault uh, that's two generations ago they just want to fight their fights right and then of course the danger comes in when the academic dogma leaks into the public space like you said what what results from this activism yes. is the issues uh, appear everywhere in the news and on social media and uh, fill up the space so sure yeah uh, in, in a way that's nothing new that's uh, that's what philosophy always has done so a right. religious philosophy comes to prominence and then it, it says well this is how we should live it should not just be an intellectual movement and so then you see religious activism yeah. and then all sorts of other uh, political movements and and scientific movements and and so on so uh, the fact that our cultural space is now, I don't know that it's dominated by, but it's significantly populated by 
second and third generation type postmodern ideas just is a testament to the power of philosophical ideas. Yep. Well, uh, one of the themes in my books, um, Stephen, is the difference between the left and right psychologically. I mean, this starts with Jonathan Haidt again. The left tends to be more activist. The left is worried about uh, caring and fairness. The right has other you know, moral agendas, uh, authority, loyalty, and, and those things. And the left tends to be louder. Uh, the right tends to be passive. The right uh, is happy living their lives. They don't want to go out and march. To, you know, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities here, but the left is much more activist. So that means they make more noise to me, and they have a greater influence over the media because they speak out more aggressively. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think Jonathan Haidt is a, an important psychologist, and I, I, I give him great credit for being a, a liberal in the true sense of liberal, uh, intellectually and, and culturally. He is treading a, a long tradition in moral philosophy called kind of moral sentiment theory, where uh, the, the argument is that human beings are not primarily rational, but they're driven more by passions, and those passions vary among different groups. And I, I don't subscribe to that understanding of, uh, of human psychology uh, uh, at, at all. Nonetheless, there is a long tradition there that, uh, that Jonathan Haidt is, is mining. But I think if you set aside the philosophical roots of Haidt's position, there is a, you know, a significant amount of truth to the, the demographic analysis. There are groups in, if we just limit ourselves to contemporary American society, for whom their primary personal and social values is this cluster of values, and then other groups that have a different cluster of values. Right. Uh, and and I, I don't think that the two clusters that you mentioned that Haidt focuses on are, are exhaustive of the terrain uh, or that they're even mutually exclusive. But if what we're interested in is a description of some of the major trends in contemporary American political discourse, I think you can get some significant traction out of that. I think you're right. Uh, you know, one way of putting it is to say the right. I'm going to put these in in quote. I, I really think right and left are terrible yes. basket phrases for for us to use. But if we use them as certain shorthand tags for American political discourse right now, the right, if you take the stereotype of it, it's much more about family values and traditional religious morality. However much it's Americanized and 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 watered down. I think it's it's wrong to say that they're not about caring and and, and fairness. Uh, they they care. They care deeply about their families. It says that what they care about in their scale of values is going to be different from the people on the left who also care but have tend to de-emphasize the family and care for different other social groupings yeah. as well. Also, uh, people on the right are I think deeply committed to fairness. Uh, but again, fairness is one of those words that you talk to four philosophers and you'll get six different definitions of what fairness is. Right. Everybody basically is committed to fairness, but uh, people on the right and people on the left have very different understandings of what fairness, uh, fairness, fairness involves. And so that takes us into issues of, of emotion. Uh, and, and back to the, the, the fundamental psychological and philosophical issues. But I do think you're right. Uh, uh, then on, on the loudness issue, right? The, it is culturally true that if you say the important thing is family and, uh, and, and, and going to your job and being a responsible worker and taking care, of, taking care of your personal business and respecting other people's family space that they're going to do their own thing, then yes, those people on average will be quieter in certain public spheres. Right. By contrast, right, people on the left, and again, if we take a cartoon stereotype version of the left, uh, and we say we think uh, current society is corrupt, that we need to have a revolution, we need to take it to the streets, we need to uh, be willing to you know, blow up certain kinds of institutions and so on. Well, then, yes, they are going to kind of rebel against their traditional institutions, including the family. 
Uh, they're going to be much more isolated, so they're going to seek another cause and they're going to be loud in other social venues as well. So I think there's a lot of truth to that. Well, and I didn't mean to appear dogmatic about that. I mean, there's no doubt that moral mm. moral politics is a, is a spectrum, is a continuum. And the yeah. extreme ideologues exist at each end. And there, you know, the farther you get out to the ends, the fewer belong to that group. And it is true that uh, the conservatives are concerned about that they have a caring function also. It's just not as they have a more complex morality, according to Height, which I agree with. Uh, the left has a simpler and, and, you know, both sides have the same moral principles. It's the degree to which it's the strength of the of various of them that influence the behavior, I think. So, uh, and, and mm -hmm. I mean, in my third mm -hmm. book, I talked about, uh, I've got a lot of research in there, which I didn't know about until recently. They, you know, they've done brain studies. You may have read this where they uh, stimulate parts of the brain and, and it, or it, they register the stim brain stimulation based on like criteria. Like for example, seem to be they, uh, the amygdala, which you may be familiar with, which is a part of the brain that does the uh, fright or flight response. The amygdala is more developed in conservatives than yes. it is in liberals. And so they, they can document that and, and, you know, conservatives tend to have more fear. They tend to be more careful. I mean, I think that's pretty well known scientifically. So there is a link. It's not just hype on his own. It's, I mean, there's supporting documentation, but again, I'm not trying to be dogmatic about, you know, I'm not trying to put people in boxes because that becomes a dangerous thing. It's people are individuals. No, but then, then, of course, there's the entire issue about the uh, the current status of your amygdala fear responses and what sorts of things trigger, and whether that is uh, uh, biologically innate in individuals or whether that's an acquired that your brain is trained a certain way depending on beliefs and experiences you've had when, right. when you are younger. Right. So, so for example, you know, if, if you take a, a number of children and from day one, you tell them that, uh, you know, Satan is lurking everywhere and God is watching you. And if you make a wrong choice, you're going to burn in hell for the rest of your life. Then yes, that's going to train people to have a fearful attitude toward the world at large. And so that's going to set them up by the time they're mature for at least broadly a certain kind of cultural politics. Yeah, right. Sure. Right. And I okay. think, um, I mean, everything I've read, I mean, in the psychological studies that where they try and do uh, correlation factors, they, no one can produce a correlation factor above about 0.4 or 0.5. So mm -hmm. no, to me, sensible mm -hmm. researchers will not go beyond the point of saying that it, if, if it's half genetic, it's still half environment. I mean, you're you're heavily influenced by your environment. I mean, they, you probably read about the twin studies where they take twins whose parents die and then they're separated yeah. and then they turn out to be, you know, largely the same people, but not, not exactly. So uh, we, we live in a world that's partly yeah. genetic and partly influenced by the environment. Okay, and I would add a third factor there and that is uh, volition. Because again, you can have twins who are raised in pretty much the same environment, but they end up making very different choices about various things. So they, they eat the same foods and they have the same basic biology. But at one point, one of them says, I like broccoli. And the other one says, I don't like broccoli. Right. And maybe that person doesn't like broccoli, right, for, for whatever reasons, right? Yeah. Or this twin, they, they both read the same book, but this twin focused on these issues in the book and the other twin focused on other issues in the book. And so they come to have different beliefs about whatever it is. So it's a, it's a, a, a tripartite um, um, uh, set of factors. So it's a environment, volition, and right, genes. 
Uh, and that also goes back to the one of the problems, of course, with the whole left-right spectrum is, and where you're trying to say it, when you get to the extremes, they start to look similar to each other. And that typically indicates the limitation of a spectrum. You're just measuring one dimension. Right. And that's not the only dimension. So right. if you uh, uh, if you take the left, you know, the left will say if you push it, your loyalty as an individual should be to the state and you should be obedient to the state and the group. And if you push some versions of the right to the extreme, they will say you should primarily be loyal to your family or you should be loyal to God and you should be obedient to, to God. But what they have, both of them, is uh, a shared premise that you should be loyal to something beyond yourself. Right. right. And so a third alternative is going to be a kind of individualism. You know, we're, we're individuals with our own lives to live, and that should be our, our fundamental, not obedience to some other group or institution. One of the fundamental dilemmas I have about the left, and I'm interested in hearing your comments about this, and it comes out brilliantly in your book where you talk about the history of socialist thought starting from Rousseau and on forward. Mm. And the left has never been able to accept the fact that socialism doesn't work. I mean, it's an endless trek for them to prove that, that, that it does. And I mean, we went through Marxism. Mm. We went, I mean, you, you know the journey. Uh, utopianism, all the mm. things that have been tried, uh, you know, the critical theory from the Frankfurt School, redefining uh, socialism, uh, the realization that, that yeah, communist sure. Russia was corrupt, and then, then they uh, attached themselves to Mao, and then there was the, the great starvation, and they realized that that was really a corrupt system. But it never, there, and maybe, maybe it's, it's housed in a hatred of capitalism because they view capitalism as inequality and inequality is wrong in their moral point of view. So it's a constant quest for a solution to the immorality of capitalism. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot packed into that and that's, uh, that's nicely said. I think uh, the first thing I would say is that the, the left is not primarily concerned with practicality that they will always say in the face of any disaster that happens, uh, our system is moral. We believe in the rightness of our cause and whether this particular experiment works or not is ultimately not the most important consideration. So what, uh, what always signs signals that rather is the leftists who will say, uh, capitalism might work better, but it's immoral. And to me, morality is more important. Right. Or that socialist experiment failed in practice, but I still believe that socialism is an ideal. So they carry around in their heads some deep dichotomy between what works in the world and what morality is. And they have some morality that does not come from an understanding of what's actually practically feasible in the world. And that's a, that's a deep philosophical issue. Now, one connection I would make here is to people who are strongly religious, who have a similar version of this, who will say, I believe in my religion, and even if my religion not lead to practical success, they will say practical success is not the important thing, right? My understanding right. of what's true and noble and important is not measured by practicality. So I have some otherworldly source for my value framework and practical uh, results in the world really are, are irrelevant to, to evaluating that. So that, that's one deep issue. And I think it's partly a psychological issue and partly a, 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 a philosophical issue. But another thing though, I, I would say is um, uh, to say that socialism doesn't work, you do have to fill in the blank there, which is to say work at what? Right. What is, what's the value that you are trying to achieve? And I would say in some cases, socialism does work. There are lots of practical examples of socialism working. Uh, if you think, for example, of, of most uh, religious monasteries and convents, they are organized on socialist lines where there's no personal property, 
Everybody works together, everybody sleeps together, everybody eats and prays and so forth at the same time. And so it's, it's pretty much a kind of communalistic socialist ideal. And that, that can work if your goal is to uh, uh, just have people uh, live that way. You can have that carrying on for generation after generation. There are lots of examples of uh, communes in, in Europe, uh, small scale communes and uh, um, in the United States and Canada where uh, you, you get 50 people together, you've got a thousand acres or whatever, and you live more or less communally sharing everything and so forth. So I, I wanna say if, if your goal is a small scale society, maybe 50 people or so, and you have no real material aspirations, it can work, right? If that's what your, your standard of working. So the socialisms that can't work is if you want to say, we want to have a society in which tens of millions of people live together peacefully. Socialism cannot achieve that goal. I think that right. record is shown. If you want to have a, an innovative high-tech society, socialism can't achieve that goal because it cannot cultivate innovation and, and incentivize innovation and, and so forth uh, and so on. So that's why uh, you know, it's important that various kinds of you know, uh, agrarian versions of socialism, such as we saw in, in Cambodia and China and so on, they can't work. They can't, socialism can't scale up. And uh, the kinds of industrial high-tech versions of socialism, like in the Soviet Union, those ones didn't work. You know, they could take, you know, 80%, I'm just making this number up because I don't have it at my fingertips, they can take 80% of their GDP and give all kinds of special privileges to their best mathematicians and engineering engineers. And they can achieve a few, you know, high-tech things, but they can't sustain it and they can't spread it to the, the broad, uh, broad masses of society. So if socialism working means large scale society or high tech society or industrial society, I think the lesson is, no, it can't do that. But then we come back to your question is, okay, why are the socialists then of the next generation not phased by that? And it's very hard to find a socialist who will sit down and say, maybe I need to rethink my ideals right, uh, and abandon my ideals. The, the ideals do operate at a very basic, almost faith level or axiomatic level commitment in their, in their, uh, their, their personal psychology. And I agree with you on the religious analog. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if they are unwilling to, to accept the fact that it doesn't work, that shows you the strength of their passion, the strength of their belief in, in fairness, in, in caring for others and the importance of equality. Now, to yeah. change... Let me, let, me, let me jump in okay. right there, though. But, but what I would also say is that what the history of socialism shows is... But I would say by the time you're 25 years old, I would, I would say this, that if you still believe in socialism after age 25, you do not believe in fairness and you do not actually care about human beings. Okay. You are much more committed to an abstracted ideology and you're more committed to not being able to admit that you have made a mistake. So I would say if you are... A 25-year-old person, at that point, you are educated. If you have political opinions, you look at the world and you see that socialism has killed tens of millions of human beings. Right. And your reaction to that is, well, you're not a caring about human beings person. Right. If you can blow off the deaths of tens of right. millions of human beings, that's right. just not possible. Now let me divert. Else is let me divert for a second because we talk about the passion of the left. Uh, one of the things that shocked me in researching the third book, you know, I told you I was uh, looking at research on brain function in relation to political morality and all that. It turns out that that mm. conservatives do not like equality. Conservatives are uncomfortable with equality. And apparently the reason is because they feel that the natural what sense of equality, Mike, um, level social structure, uh, no, uh, 
they are more comfortable with a social hierarchy because they believe that that's the natural human existence, that people who are more intelligent or more motivated uh, rise to the top and that's logical. And other, I mean, it's, it's sort of a Darwinian uh, approach uh, and maybe it's, you know, it comes from millennial of millennial uh, thinking over, you know, thousands and thousands of years, but they are less comfortable in what they view as a level society where it has equality because they think it's unnatural. So that's part of the thing about, I mean, the difference between left and right, they, their sense of equality, equality just doesn't rise to the same level with them as it does those on the left. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm struggling right now because conservative is a big, uh, big tent basket label. Yep. Um, and as is equality, it's another, it's another huge concept that has you know, many sub strands of equality. So I would need to see this parsed out a lot because when I think of uh, stereotypical conservatives, I think of people who take some measure of religion seriously and they will believe sincerely that all human beings are equal under God. Right. And they will believe that all human beings should have equal rights to life, liberty, say, in the pursuit of happiness. Yep. So, and they're very serious about that as, as equality. Uh, but the kinds of e in equality that they, that they don't find as problematic are going to be, you know, uh, you earned a million dollars, and you, uh, but I went bankrupt. So I have a you know, net worth of negative $100,000. Well, that's fine. Um, so I would need to see specified what dimensions of equality we're talking about. Okay. Um, yeah, and I don't have the the research at my fingertips. I'd be happy to share it with you. And again, it's no. you know research to try to get at differences between left and right points of view in relation to brain function. It, it's psychological testing. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not saying it's definitive. Uh, I'm just pointing it out. Yeah. So, you know, one concrete example we might think in terms of, you know, is, is say sports. So some people win a lot of gold medals at the Olympics and championships, and then other people uh, don't. Um, right. What's your reaction to that? I think it's true to say that lots of people are comfortable with the idea, well, there are natural differences between human beings. And so there are going to be hierarchies in sports that evolve. It's also the case that some people make different choices. They decide to practice a certain sport a lot. Other people are lazier or just not interested so they don't practice a lot. And so it's not a natural difference, but rather an acquired differences. Yeah. That they're, and so you know, if you win a lot of gold medals at the Olympics because you work really hard, and here I am, Stephen Hicks, I chose to read a lot of books. And so nobody gave me an Olympic gold medal for any, any track medal. Well, that's, that's perfectly fine. But there are also, if we then switch over to the left, um, uh, the idea that there is something wrong with sports uh, per se, including competitive sports, just because in sports, there are some people who are winners and some people who are losers and some people who get a lot of medals and championship trophies and lots of money and while other people don't have a lot of those things. Right. So there is a kind of understanding of moral fairness that leads them to say, you know, I'm not interested in sports as a matter of my morality. I don't think competition is the way human beings should be interacting with each other because competition leads to unequal outcomes. So that uh, more basic moral impulse. I think it's pre-political and you might find it more concentrated in what we now call the contemporary left, but I don't think it's only a contemporary left thing. So I'm, I'm resisting a little bit the, uh, the, the political categorizations that are going on there. But I am very interested in where people come up with in the first place and saying, well, there are natural differences between human beings and I'm okay with that versus those who say there are no differences between human beings that are morally relevant, we should all be the same. And between those who want to say, 
uh, we should reward some people more and some people less. And other people want to say, no, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Everybody should get the same rewards. Well, that, that brings to mind the old uh, argument these days about little league uh, football players or baseball players where everybody gets a trophy. Exactly. Now, sure. the, the right objects to that because I think because they say that's OK, except sometime you're going to enter the real world and it won't you everybody won't get a trophy there. When you graduate right. from from college, it doesn't work that way anymore. So shouldn't Little League reflect a part of the acclimation toward growth and maturity and living your life? Right. And then the left is going to respond to say, well, that's the way society is right now. But we don't think the organization of society with its reward structure is appropriate so we need to retrain young people so that they can grow up to be the kinds of people who will reform society or perhaps revolutionize society. And that means we need to start with little league and teach them not to be competitive and so on. And I see this, I do a certain amount of work in philosophy of education uh, where there are, can be knockdown drag them out fights among teachers over something like the spelling bee. Right. And one, right. you know, one side wants to say, you know, we, uh, we have spell, spelling bees and it's a little competition and kids have fun with it. And, you know, the, the kids who win, they get social esteem and, 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 and it also, it works. They learn a lot of words and so on. And the other teachers want to say spelling bees are immoral because right. they teach uh, that, you know, one person ultimately wins and everybody else is a loser. And some people have hurt feelings and uh, we don't believe in competition at all. So we need to teach spelling by kind of non-spelling B, non-competitive methods. Right. Now, and, that's a right, fascinating and, debate to me. Right, and then this goes to the discussion in part of the fight of tribalism is victimhood versus self-actualization. Because yes. the, the right wants people to pull, their self, pull themselves up. And I think the right accepts the fact that a lot of people are disadvantaged from doing that. But the point is that if you take control of your life versus letting someone determine what that life is going to be, you, that's the, the better path to escape, I guess, to, to push yourself forward. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree that there is a self-responsible, self-actualization ethic, and that some people on the right accept that ethic. But again, we're back to now, in this case, on the right, the right is a very big tent. And many of the people I know who are on the political right would say things like, uh, you know, uh, God ultimately decides uh, my, my course in life. God is not my co-pilot, but God is my pilot. And so it's not a self-actualization thing. You know, my, my, my ultimate destiny is ultimately directed by forces beyond my, beyond my control. And that's a shared premise with the, uh, the victimization that's characteristic of some significant strands on the left, which I mean, victimization does also come from the sense that you are a pawn being pushed around by forces beyond your control. It's not divine forces. Typically, it's social forces beyond your control. Yep. So I see that lack of self-empowerment in some strands on both the right and the left. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. I agree with you. Fair enough. Um, we're not talking too much about postmodernism, are we? No. We're, we're, we're talking <laughs> social morality. Um, but let me get back to postmodernism for a minute in, the, in our times getting short. Uh, it, I asked you this question in an email one time and we didn't really get to talk about it, but I wonder what your thoughts are about what makes the United States or made the United States more susceptible to postmodernism than perhaps Western Europe. Uh, I think at the time you answered me and you said you th thought the philosophical uh, pillars in Europe had been established long before mm. and were very strong, whereas the, you know, philosophy in the United States has been somewhat eclectic. We've had a little bit of our own stuff. And um, 
it's more fluid or maybe less mature or whatever, but I'm curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question because you know, postmodernism as a kind of highly skeptical, highly cynical and adversarial understanding of, of the world, kind of a rejection of modernism, the idea that you know, there are universal individual rights and science and progress and so forth, and we're making the world a better place. So a rejection of all of that optimism it did take place in intellectual circles in the United States much more than it did in places like Europe. I would broaden it to say, you know, I'm, I'm a native of Canada and uh, postmodernism has been strong in Canada, also in Australia, kind of also in the, uh, the, the British Empire diaspora or the, or right. the post-British Empire countries as well. Uh, in Western Europe, it was uh, weaker, even though I think its roots there are, are, are there philosophically. And now also uh, in my travels in Eastern Europe, postmodernism is very weak there. I think right. East Europe is uh, much more realist. Uh, they, they've experienced communism and socialism for real. They want to get rich, and that's brought with them a certain kind of realism that, that resists all of what they see as a kind of a decadent skepticism that uh, postmodernism represents. Now, why the United States though? Because you're right that it was most prominent in the United States. I mean, one answer is that by the time you got to the middle part of the 20th century, the latter part of the 20th century, most of the best universities in the world were in the United States. Lots of good universities elsewhere in the world, but a huge concentration uh, of them in the United States. And so the, uh, the philosophy departments where I think all of these high tech arguments were being developed, most of them were in the United States. So philosophers typically are very smart. They can take a position, they can tear it apart, put it together in various different ways and follow the logic ruthlessly to its end point. So I think it was mostly in American universities that these ideas that had been developed in Europe were taken, really run with and, and, uh, and, uh, and instantiated. So I think that's one kind of, one kind of uh, explanation. I think another part of the explanation though is, uh, and you see this a little more in Canada where I fr come from, uh, that we are kind of post-British colo colonial society. You know, we achieved our independence, uh, you know, maybe a hundred and something years ago and the Americans still a couple of hundred years ago but there is still a strong uh, sense of, I don't wanna overstate this, kind of cultural inferiority with respect to Europe, that we are still the new countries, we're the, we're the little kids who are maybe growing up very fast, but the Europeans are sophisticated and serious and the, and the, the deep sources of culture. So you still find, particularly among humanities intellectuals, a looking to Europe, and anything European has a kind of cachet. So I think one part of the explanation is the fact that in the 1950s, when Derrida was brought over, you know, here's this sophisticated French guy, right, with the cutting edge. And that's, woo, sophisticated French guy. Right. And despite the, the, the American intellectuals having a pretty high sense of themselves, nonetheless, they're still going to take their cues from the Europeans and from Nietzsche and from Heidegger and from Foucault and, and, and so forth. So I think that at least in terms of, it's, it's kind of to do it in terms of a marketing uh, cachet uh, right. explanation, but I think that was an additional, in, in, in addition rather to the strength of the philosophical arguments that had been developed, it had this overlay of European sophistication and coolness that made it highly susceptible. I would say the same thing for existentialism, which was very trendy in the 50s and the 1960s. And existentialism, there's a lot of proto postmodern elements in it that uh, you find lots of American uh, uh, students, graduate students and young professors who are taken with what seems to be this sexy, sophisticated, slightly decadent European phenomenon, existentialism. Right. and Trying, uh, trying to uh, kind of elevate their own status by adopting those the European. Now, um, it's never just one thing, but I think that that's part of the explanation. Okay. Uh, I think we're reaching the end of our time here uh, because yes. you've got uh, something to do and uh, we want to respect that. So 
Thank uh, you. We didn't, we just broke the surface on our discussion, I think, because we didn't get very deep into postmodernism, but I appreciate the direction the discussion went. Uh, I think it was very uh, useful. Uh, always always good. fun, yeah. yeah. Always good to get your thoughts. So uh, we'll wrap it up for now and uh, hope to have another talk sometime in the future. Absolutely, right. Michael. Yeah, it was a fun discussion. Thanks for having me on. And let's okay. do it again, for sure. All right, great. Bye See you later. Now.